if it hasn't rained for a long time, is there anything that we can do to maybe help um, make it so the rain does come? I know for, for a lot of people, you know, it hasn't rained, hasn't rained, so they go wash their car. And as soon as they wash their car, it like rains the next day. Or uh, hasn't been raining for a long time, so you plan some outdoor activities. And sure enough, it rains the day that you're planning on doing things. Um, you know, if, if, we, if we would blow our diet on a single meal, you know, as, uh, you know, people try to watch what they eat, but then they just really blow it. Uh, they go out to eat and they, they indulge themselves. You know, what should our next steps be if that's the case? For some people say, hey, I've already messed up this much. I'm going to have more dessert. Or maybe there are those that just say, you know what, i got to stop now before it gets too out of hand. Well, in the book of Hebrews, you know, we've been going through uh, Hebrews for the last several weeks. And the writer of Hebrews has been pointing to the person of Jesus and, and who he is and revealing truths about him. And the writer explained what uh, about the, the temple, the tabernacle, and and the place called the most holy place where uh, the high priest would go into that into that room once a year to to do the work that he was supposed to do well in verse 19 of chapter 10 it's written it says therefore brothers and sisters since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God. And so he opens up this section. Since this has happened, since we have uh, access to the most holy place, since we have this great priest over the house of God, what should we do? And with those facts, what were the people to do? And what are we supposed to do? Because that's the truth for us, too. Uh, Jesus has given us the way into that most holy place, the holy of holies, into the presence of God. And he is our high priest that is interceding for us and mediating between us and God. So what are some things we can do? And we're going to go line by line through this, this passage. Number one, we need let us draw near to God. Since these things have happened, since Jesus has given us the way to the most holy place, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, one, let us draw near to God. And as we draw near to him, it says, with a sincere heart. And you think about our relationship with God the Father, with God the Son, and God the Spirit. We have to have a sincere heart. You know, so many people, they, they go through the motions. Uh, they, go, they do the, the work that they are expected to do. They meet the requirements. But it's not a sincere heart. And in fact, there are places where God has said, where he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And so since we have access to God the Father, to that most holy place through Christ, draw near to him with that sincere heart, but also with the full assurance that faith brings. What is assurance? Assurance is having that confidence and certainty of faith. You know, do we have that assurance that the faith that we have in God is truth? It's real. Believing that the word of God is complete truth. There is no error in it. And as we draw near to him to have our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience. You know, the blood of Christ cleanses us. You know, Jesus willingly came into this world knowing that he would end up on a cross, shedding his blood, 
for the forgiveness of our sins. And with that blood sprinkled upon us, God sees his son. He no longer sees our sins. He sees his son. And so our hearts are sprinkled to, to cleanse us from sin, but also to free us from a guilty conscience. You know, as we draw near to God, that that guilt is taken away. It's the enemy that reminds us of our sins, of our shortcomings. It's the enemy that tries to knock us off track. But because of the grace of God, through the blood of Christ, we are cleansed. And we no longer have a guilty conscience because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If we can get to that place, and as we draw closer to God, that will become a reality. And he also says, as you draw near to God, uh, have your bodies washed with pure water. I mean, that could allude to a baptism. But Paul wrote uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, he's talking about the bride which ends up being the church of Jesus Christ. He says that we are to make her holy by cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. So our, having our bodies washed with pure water through the, with the word of God, with the word who is Jesus Christ. So since we have access to the most holy place, and since we have a great high priest, let us draw near to God. But then number two, we need to let us, let us hold on to the hope we profess. And it says there, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. What is our hope? You know, we go to church, we go to Bible studies, uh, we pray, we, we give, we do work, good, good deeds. But what is our hope? What is the hope that we have as we live in this world? Well, that hope is salvation through Christ. Our hope is in eternity. Life eternal. Not separation from God for eternity, but life with him for all of eternity. Because it tells us that he who promised what he has given us, what he has promised is faithful. You know, Jesus has promised life to all who believe in him. Is that the hope that you have? Are we holding on to that hope that we're saved by the grace of God through faith and not by works? I mean, I am so thankful for that because I know I fall short every day. But because of the grace of God, through faith in Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed, I have eternal life. My sins are forgiven. <laughs> and we have that hope for eternity along with holding on for the hope that we pro profess. Number three, let us spur one another on. And this is an important point. You know, it says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. You know, when we come together, when we meet together, you know, we're to challenge one another. And I've often said, you know, at our church, the greeting time, it lasts forever, which I love. But how, how many conversations are building each other up, challenging one another? It was it say there, spur one another on toward love and good deeds. You know, working together to love one another, to love others, and to do the good works that God wants us to do in helping each other, but also helping others out in the world. Now, he wants us to spur one another on. He says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. And I think this is, uh, you know, this is a passage that the church, um, the church, local churches, they use to say we need to meet together. 
We need to come. Do not do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. We need to spend time with one another. But that doesn't necessarily mean church services. It is nice for everyone to come together and to, to fellowship and to worship and to look into the word of God. But the scripture also tells us that where two or more are gathered, he is there with them. That is church. And so what he's saying, don't give up meeting together. Some are the habit of doing. Okay, we have accepted Christ. He is my savior. So now I can just go live my life on my own. And he's saying, no, I want you to come together, meet together, whether that's just two people or three people or 30 people or 300 people. He wants us to spend time together um, for the purpose of growth, growing in our faith, growing in our love, growing in our abilities. And he says, encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Not tearing each other down, but encouraging one another in faith and love and action. Supporting one another, building each other up. But along with spurring one another on, number four, we let us pursue righteousness. And I think this is an area I, we talked, I touched on this like last week or the week before of, you know, a, addressing sin in the lives. He wants us to pursue righteousness. Verse 26, he says, if we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth. He says, no sacrifice for sins is left. Many times, Jesus, when he would heal people or he would uh, forgive people, he would often tell them, now go and sin no more. Leave that life of sin behind and move into a life of righteousness. Because any sin that we allow into our lives will pull us away from that relationship that we have with God. And that's why he says here, you know, if we deliberately keep on sinning, no sacrifice for sins is left. Because Jesus came once for all and gave his life for us. But what we should be doing is having a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Again, we're saved by grace and not by works, but that does not give us a license to sin. You know, Paul dealt with that. Should we sin all the more so that grace can abound? By no means. We are to pursue righteousness. We are to remove sin from our lives. But to do that, we have to address it. As we pursue righteousness, you know, why test God's judgment by pursuing sin that we know is sin? Pursue righteousness. He says in verse 28, anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? You know, if we choose sin, we know the sin that is in our lives. We know that place where we mess up. And if we choose to live in that sin, even though we know what Jesus did for us, why risk the punishment for what Jesus died to take away? He died to cover our sins, to take away our sins, to conquer sin so that we can conquer sin. And he says, you know, 
someone who, how much severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them? No, he's saying, you know, per, as we pursue righteousness, if we continue in sin after salvation, it's like treating the blood of Christ with contempt, treating the blood of Christ as meaningless. Treating what Jesus did on our behalf as a waste of time. Because if we continue sinning, it's as we have insulted the spirit of grace. Now think about that. Continued sin brings insults to the Lord for whom we have received his grace. Because we're saved by the grace of God. For we know who said, him who said, verse 30, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Now, if we turn away from righteousness, there will be punishment. It is mine to avenge, declares the Lord. And he will judge us because our God is holy. And there cannot be any anything that is unholy in his presence. His judgment will always be right. And that's why it's so important for us in our faith. I mean, we're pursuing righteousness. But our, in our faith, understanding the impact of Jesus in our lives. That because of him, we can be set free. We are free from sin. Through the blood of Christ. And then the writer writes in verse 31, It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, do we want to chance our eternal state in the hands of the living God by choosing to live contrary to what his desires are for us? So let us pursue righteousness. Then, number five, let us find confidence in our faith. Verse 32, remember those earlier days after you had received the light when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were, who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had a better and lasting possession. You know, the early Christians, they, they endured pain and persecution because of their faith. They were driven out of, the, out of the synagogues and they were driven out of their families because of their faith. And they willingly accepted it. They joyfully accepted it. The confiscation of their property and everything because they knew they had a better and lasting possession. They understood their eternal state was more valuable than anything on the earth. And, and for us, we put a lot of value in the things of the world, our possessions. But the true value is found in our faith in Christ. And so we need to put that confidence in him. Verse 35, so do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly Rewarded, where we remain confident in our faith, knowing that we will be rewarded for it. You know, it's our faith in Him that will get us through. It's the power of God that will lead us on. And because of that, number six, let us persevere in our faith. Verse 36, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. You know, sometimes things are going to get tough when it comes to things of faith. You know, he has promised us life with him. He hasn't promised us easy street. He has promised us life. 
But he's also told us that everyone's going to hate us because of him. They hated him first and they're going to hate us because we are his brothers and sisters. And in a little while, he is going to return to take us home. And so we need to persevere in that faith. We are to persevere in faith and not shrink back when temptations rise, when persecution comes. Because he takes no pleasure in those who shrink back. We need to stand firm in the faith. We need to persevere through the good times and the bad. Through the easy times and especially in the hard times. Persevere in our faith. And then number seven, let us strive to have faith and be saved. Along with that perseverance, we need to strive for that faith. Real understanding and believing in that we are saved. Verse 39, but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. We need to pursue him. Draw near to him. Trust him. And if we go back to where we began in verse 19, the truth is we can have confidence to enter the most holy place, the presence of God, by the blood of Jesus. We can enter the most holy place by the way that was opened for us through the work of Christ. Because there was a time where to enter into that most holy place, high priest, once a year, there was this thick curtain that had to be that they had to go through to enter. And Jesus brought that curtain down so that through him we can enter into the presence of God. We do have a high priest over the house of God, the true house of God that will one day descend to this earth. And because of this, we can now enter into his presence and live wholeheartedly for him today and for the rest of eternity. Since we have such a God, then let us live for him. God bless. Have a great day. And I'll see you next time.